We are in Acts chapter 9, and this is a very important uh, study, very important part of our walk through the book of Acts. We've been here for a while now, and I think it's been an encouragement to me, and I hope it is to you as well. So, Acts chapter 9, we're going to try and cover verses 1 through 19. You know, when I look around, I, I see terrorist attacks or evil in the world today, I think it's safe to say that it's in those moments where many of us are eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus. Um, and I think uh, every time I'm reminded of the savagery of man, uh, we actually look for particularly the coming back of the warrior Jesus. Uh, you, you don't really hear Jesus referred to as a warrior unless you're talking about end times and so on. That's many of the depictions we see in the return of Christ where Jesus comes back as judge to judge the world. And there's a greater sense, I think, today in Christians to be thankful of the fact that there is a day of judgment and there is a day of reckoning. But I want to, in this study, impress upon you uh, that at this time, while we're here, prior to Christ coming back and returning, there's another way that Jesus subdues His enemies. Whether they are the enemies of ISIS or radical Muslims or whether they're atheists or just profitable sinners in the United States, the Lord Jesus does a work as King in subduing people to Himself by restraining and conquering all there in our enemies by the power of His grace. And I I honestly think that there is no greater example of that in any place in the Scriptures than the conversion of Saul who would become Paul the Apostle. Uh, This is a text that is just rich with lessons, lessons about human psychology, lessons about how God deals with people just like us. It's rich with lessons about how God converts people. And so today, as I said, we're walking through Acts 9, 1 through 19, and as you know, you've got a, a, a heavy amount of notes there, and that's for this reason. It's because this is one of three accounts in the book of Acts where this story is repeated, okay? So there are some little details in the other two that are in the, the original one. So we're going to try and just not, not go through all three of the accounts, but splice in those little details as we walk through the story in Acts 9. So in Acts 22, 1 through 21, Paul's before a mob at Jerusalem, and he begins to give his testimony, this account that we see about how the Lord converted him. And then Acts 26, 1 through 20, you remember who Paul's before that time? He's before the king, King Agrippa. And it's very interesting, actually, that there's a commission given here in Acts chapter 9 that the Lord says through Ananias to Saul, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Israel. And he's going to do that in a special way in Acts 26. And so our lesson, our sermon is entitled, as you see in your notes there, A Hunter Hunted, An Enemy conquered. And so let's walk through the text much like we do each week. We'll walk through the text and see some things we can glean from God's word. Verses 1 through 2 of Acts chapter 9 is where we'll start. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So obviously the high priest at this time had permission that if it was a disciplinary matter, he could call people to return to Jerusalem to a hearing. And actually, this is the first time in Acts 22.4, you get a little bit of a fuller picture of of what what all this is about. Notice, remember the church has grown. It's, It's gone south where there was an Ethiopian that was converted. It's gone north to the Mongols or the half breeds or of Samaria, right? And not only that, but now we know it's even gone further north to Damascus. And so the the church is spreading, and and Saul is concerned. And so in Acts 22.4, look what he says. He says, I persecuted this way, that's the way is referring to the Christian movement, spreading of the way, to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. As also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. This is a guy who's 
full of malice, and he is angry. And then in Acts 26, 11, he adds to that. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. That's the first thing we note in our text, is that Paul was an epitome of Israel's rebellion against Christ. Paul was the epitome of Israel's rebellion against Christ. That language there is strong, isn't it? You ever been furiously enraged at anybody? Probably in traffic, right, I imagine, would just be the first thing that comes in my mind. Uh, And he's not going to stop, Saul is not going to stop until these people are put to death. So the Holy Spirit adds to these terms to, to, to kind of picture Saul as a corporate Israel going after the church because they can't go after Christ anymore. And so that raises a question as we look at this that's in our notes here. Why? Why? Why is this dude so mad? Why did Saul rage? What was it that put fury into this young man? Well, chapter 22, verse 3, you get a hint of it in one word that's in that text and see if you can pull it out. Saul, Paul says, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Paul was raging. Paul did this because he was zealous for God as he understood God. And and, and church, you realize, right, that that those accounts that we hear the news today, many of those terrorist attacks we see in our culture are people who are zealous for God in the way they understand Him? Paul was one of them. He was zealous. Why? Now, let's think about what be coursing through Saul's mind and, and, and heart as a, as a young, bold, hotshot Pharisee, okay? He was one that we know consented at whose death in Acts chapter 6, you remember? Stephen, right? And and Stephen, if you remember all that speech of what Stephen said, it's glorious text. Stephen was the one who said, you seek to worship at this temple, but God isn't worshiped in temples that are made with human hands. So in that, Stephen actually opposed the symbol of Israel's nationhood. He opposed the presence of God being with Israel of the uniqueness of that whole nation. So he was regarded as a blasphemer. Plus, Stephen also said, you haven't kept the law. Stephen had upheld this Jesus who said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. Jesus had also opposed the temple and it was Jesus who, according to the Jews, had disavowed and disregarded the Torah. The temple, the Torah, but also, remember, Jesus had been crucified. What did Paul see the crucifixion as? It was a curse. He who hanged on the tree is accursed. Why? Why was he crucified? Because he made himself out to be God, and that was blasphemy. And not only that, but these Christians, they're following him in this way. They're following Jesus, who according to Stephen, means that they're actually opposed to the nation of Israel. They are traitors in Paul's mind. They are opposing law. They are against our God. They are blasphemers because they support this Christ, and they're making proselytes out of others. They're actually spreading this from north to south, even as far as Damascus. Therefore, not only in Saul's mind, because Stephen was blasphemous and Christ was blasphemous, but the disciples were blasphemous. And what did the scriptures commend about blasphemers in the Old Testament? Did not Jehu say, come and see my zeal for the Lord of hosts as he killed the opponents of God? So Saul was jealous. He was zealous, Deuteronomy 17, 7. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. This was in his mind, in his head. Church family, this is why, I always say this, we really have to beware of misguided religious zeal. Now, is zeal a good thing? Yeah. 
In fact, how, how can you experience the saving grace of Christ and not have a little zeal? It's important to be zealous. Paul actually goes on in Galatians, I think, chapter 4, to talk about how eagerly zealous we should be for the, the gospel. But you beware of false zeal because it's, it, it's a fine line. And, and I tell you what, historically, you look at things that are done in the name of the church and you'll find a lot of religiously false zeal that leads to beheadings and massacres. This close. So you beware of misguided false zeal. Now what I find interesting in, in Saul is this. East meets west in this character Saul right now. Because Saul was a Pharisee according to the law. He was, he was blameless, pious, and zealous for God. But he also was a murderer. He was a slanderer and destroyer. That's a conundrum you're going to see throughout this entire story here. One actually, not only you'll just see in the story, but one that Paul's going to wrestle with his whole life, even though he did, as a, as a for, forgiven sinner, he still wrestled with this. It's a, it's a false zeal for righteousness, a false piety. See, friends, that can be the same thing as being a slanderer, a murderer, and a destroyer. It's a very interesting philosophical, psychological conundrum that's going on in Saul. And this is why he's enraged, because he's a man of zeal for God as he falsely understood him. You want to know why doctrine's important? Because false doctrines can lead to beheadings and massacres. You want to know why the Word of God is important for you to not just, not just listen to on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, but dive into and search and seek the wisdom of God? Because you get some misguided zeal? Some really bad stuff can happen. So let's consider this. In verses 3 through 7 of Acts 9, Paul is now stopped in his trash. Listen, I love this. Look at verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. you got to imagine this, okay? Where is he? He's on the road, but what's surrounding him? Nothing. He's in a desert. He's in a desolate area here. Saul is, is full of that fury. He's breathing in threats and murder. All he can think of is the hatred he has to destroy the Christians. It's midday. It's a hot sun. And all of a sudden, a light hotter than the sun comes and knocks Saul flat on his face. And he hears a voice. Verse 4. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Here's the head of heaven, who, by the way, is vitally united with his members of his church on earth. It's as if, with all the persecution that the church is enduring, that Saul has done, Jesus has felt the chains, Jesus has felt the sword, Jesus has felt the accusation, and so he says to Saul, why do you persecute me? You'd think he'd say, why are you persecuting my church? That's not what he says. Because when you persecute the church of God, you're really persecuting Christ. That's how united he is with his church. And then look at verse 5. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I am the Savior. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus says, I'm the Jesus you're persecuting. I'm the Jesus who you said was a blasphemer. I'm the one you heard had been raised from the dead. I'm the Jesus that you sought to destroy. Not, not I was Jesus, but I am Jesus whom you are persecuting and my members in the church. And it's in that statement you've got there in your notes, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. In that brief period of time that it took Jesus to say it, however he said it, I think at least three things are happening in Paul's mind here. First, he knows now that Jesus is alive. Because the book of Acts is about the fact that Jesus is alive 
And he is at work. That's right. Number two, I think he knows that Jesus and his church are united. You see it. Why are you persecuting me? We already talked about that. And number three, he sees the Christian faith is absolutely true. You had resolved your whole life to destroy every vestige of the faith, but it's true. And church family, the Christian faith is true, and Jesus is the Savior. And so Saul's conversion that, that comes here is really indeed one of the great proofs of the Christian religion. In Acts 26, 14, we see this expression added to this. This was common among that day, in the Greeks at that time. It says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Anybody want to take a shot at what the goads are? Anybody know what a goad is? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, similar to a cattle prod, right? It's something that's supposed to uh, annoy something or someone to get them driven to where they want to go, okay? That's, that's kind of the best way I can describe it. If someone owned a bull or an ox and it was young and stubborn, they would goad the thing to move so that the ox would realize two things. I'm not my own. I have a master. My master is, 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 has a goad. <laughs> and then number two, this master will not stop goading me until I do exactly what he tells me to do. And I love that Jesus says this to him. I love this. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Really, what Jesus could have said is it's impossible for you to kick against the goad. So what are those goads? What are those things that, that prodded the apostle Paul that that struck him, that he couldn't get rid of. Saul, remember, had consented to the death of Stephen. And, and I think there must have been something in Saul, as there is in every unbeliever that says, you know what? Maybe this is true. I mean, I mean think about it. Why would he die for this? Right? Why, why was he so eloquent? Why was he so passionate? Makes sense. That was a goad in him that Jesus had sent, and it was convicting in him. It was working. Some even believe that Saul, who had been taught at the seat of Gamaliel, who would have been in the city of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, some thought that Saul would have seen Christ himself. In fact, it's very likely he could be part of the multitudes that heard Jesus say, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. That was a goad for Saul. Could the resurrection be true? I mean, Jesus did embody what the priest did not. He was a good man. He was actually innocent. Maybe his. No, 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 it can't be. That's blasphemy. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I think also the Christians, the way, who represented Christ, who were so passionate. Why were they willing to give up their homes and their lives for the sake of this one who... If he really died and stayed dead, is dead. It's a goad. It couldn't, he couldn't let it go. And brothers and sisters, I love this. Because when grace saves, grace changes the heart in a moment. God works in his grace in many ways. And these goads, they're kind of like a predatory grace, if I could put it that way. It's kind of a realization all along. And maybe you've had this in your conversion experience where you know the Lord's been after you for a while. Anybody had something like that? And it just all clicks. God, I, I saw this. This was directing me towards you. God, I, I know that this, the reason I was at this place hearing this particular gospel message was because of a goad you've put in my life. And I love that. This is This is remarkable. He was bugged by some of this stuff. He couldn't let it go. Even as he raged against Christianity, he must have said, could it be true? Now in verse 6 and 7, we're going to see that sovereign grace comes. Look at this. Verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And Jesus says, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. You know how sometimes you can, you can hear a voice, but you can't really make it out? It's, it's muzzled. Well, they could hear this voice. They knew it was something, but they couldn't make out the details here. They couldn't see anyone. Saul did see someone, but Saul didn't see much for long. <laughs> 
Which is another lesson here in verses 8 and 9. Notice it's midday. Saul is blind. Look at verses 8 and 9. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now let's go to that other account in Acts 22, 11 there. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, literally translated the glory of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. I don't know if you noticed this. One of, I, I've told you this several times. One of, our, one of our family things we like to do on a day-by-day basis is go watch the sunsets because on our front porch, it's just the most beautiful sunset you've ever seen. It's gorgeous. And so I love taking Addie out there, but I don't, I want to, I got to find the right time because you know what happens? If I take her out before the sun actually sets, I'm going to be instructing my daughter to look at that sun over there. And that's probably not going to be too good for her eyes. In fact, if she stares at the sun for any long amount of time, it could really do damage to her eyes. You could lose your sight from staring at the sun. But, but remember, this was a light That was brighter than the sun. How do you even explain that? I I don't know. That light came from the light of Christ who in his glorified being is lighter than the sun and it had this effect of blinding Saul so, so that he would not forget what he encountered. Saul was an epitome of Israel's rebellion against Messiah, but he also was the epitome of Israel's own blindness. Because interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, Get this, in a number of places, being blind at midday is a judgment upon the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 28, verses 28 through 29, it says, The Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart, and you will grope at noon. Here Saul had to be led by the hand to Damascus. Why? Well, Deuteronomy 28, Israel, you're under a curse for your disobedience. Isaiah 59, 10 We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday, as in the twilight. Why? For our transgressions are multiplied before you. See, see, this was a lesson that Saul would never forget. How wicked is the human heart? So wicked that it would even put to death the followers of this meek and lowly Jesus. I want you to notice as well, though, as we we continue on, how Saul was commissioned in a very interesting way. In in, in Acts chapter 26, 16 through 18, after Jesus says to Saul, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting, look at what happens. Verse 16. But get up and stand up on your feet. For this purpose I've appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Saul's blind here. And God commissions him when he's blind to free people from their spiritual blindness. I don't know if that's a little heavy-handed for you, the symbolism there, but it should be quite obvious, right? This blind saw would be an instrument to open the eyes of others in order to turn them from the darkness that Saul was experiencing to true light. I love this. Jesus saved Saul, and then he immediately commissioned him. And, and, and now, as you go back to Acts chapter 9, we read that this commission is going to be, going to be uh, reinforced by this one named Ananias, whose name is significant. We'll get to it in a second. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Here's what it says. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. He must have been struck with that as well. That's not something that normally happened. Even just as Samuel and Moses and Isaiah and all others were called for special works, he shows his submission to Jesus as king. And then verse 11, and the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I love this. This is Google Maps before the time, right? 
This is, Jesus lets him know exactly where this man is, even as Jesus knows exactly where you are at all times. And and I love the end there. Do you notice that little phrase at the end? He's praying. How often it's been commented on, and I believe it's true, that the active test of whether grace is in you is that you pray. I can't help but notice that. Now, now obviously, we never pray as much as we should or even as much as we want. But friends, I, I love you, I, but it's just, it's just evident. If you don't pray, you can't be a Christian. <laughs> Prayer is an evidence that you belong to Christ. Why? Because a Christian is in union with its head, the Lord Jesus. And you, as a Christian, are going to want to communicate with your head. The evidence of grace in Saul is that Saul is praying. And you have to wonder, what, what's he praying about? What could he possibly be praying about? He's blind here, right? He must have been praying for mercy, obviously. Mercy, mercy, Lord, mercy. Probably understanding. He's given this commission to go to the Gentiles for forgiveness of sins. I don't even know what the forgiveness of sins is, Lord. And the Gentiles? He's praying, Lord, am I, am I going to be blind forever? But he prayed. And then verse 12. And he has seen in a vision. This is God speaking uh, here about Saul to Ananias. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain sight. So the Lord's communicating with Saul in a vision. And Saul gets some encouragement that he is going to get his sight back. And then verse 13. But Ananias answered... Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. See, Ananias knows what he's supposed to do, but what's he feeling right now? Fear. He's afraid. The Lord in heaven is speaking to him. But ultimately, I love this. You see the struggle here. It makes sense with Ananias. But the Lord said go, and that's really all he needed to say. Because the Lord answers, because I've chosen him. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And that's number three that we notice here. Saul caused in the church an epitome of suffering. And now Saul would be an epitome of suffering himself for Christ's church. Saul is going to be this. He became the epitome of the the, the church is suffering. That's amazing. This one who caused so much. Now listen. This is not God getting revenge. Right? This isn't vengeance here. This is not exactly what that is at all. It's not a vengeance or justice. This is not the way God works. But Saul, you're going to feel the pain that all Christians experience in persecution. He's going to suffer for my name. In verse 17. It says, so Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, he said this. And I want you to wrap your heads around this. Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Brother Saul. What, What does Ananias mean? Remember, he was scared, folks, wasn't he? He was terrified of this, trembling. The Lord sends him to Saul. I'm going to send him to Ananias. I'm going to send Ananias. You know what Ananias' names mean? You know what Ananias' name means? God is gracious. So he sends this guy. God is gracious to him. Isn't that great? The one whose name represents me, Saul, is going to come to you. And that grace is shown in that beautiful expression. And he lays hands on him and he says, Not Mr. Murderer laying his hands on him. Oh, killer of Christians. No. Brother Saul. He treats him as if he's another disciple. He knows you've had an encounter with Christ and you're one of us. That's remarkable to me. Verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Let's think about the scales for a minute. That's weird, right? 
What? Cataracts. Cataracts, right? What does that have to do with anything, right? Is that just an immediate healing? They just, cataracts is great. Um, I, 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 let's think about it. Most commentators think that this could be a metaphor, I guess. I don't, I don't think so. He saw the kingdom and just spiritual cataracts came off, right? But, but most believe that these scaly substances fell from his eyes. And I want to suggest this. It's only a suggestion, but let's think about this. Because Saul would speak about Israel as blinded, right? Paul goes on to talk about Israel as having a veil, right, removed, that came only as they looked upon Christ. And so there's Saul's experience that represents this. But what are those scales and what is that veil? Remember our conundrum earlier? Saul is pious and Saul is a murderer. What's the link between the two? It is, but it's really the sin of self-righteousness. Do you see that link? He, he's pious, but he's a murderer, and the connection is self-righteous. He's a self He didn't need to confess his sin. He's pious. He didn't have to worry about the fact that he was killing people. He was zealous. And if you're self-righteous, you're going to put scales over your own heart unlike any other's. You're going to think that you don't need Christ and you're going to live the way you want because you are already righteous in your own eyes. You can even do wicked things. It doesn't matter because you are self-righteous. The more those scales are over your heart, the more they blind you to the gospel that came into the world to save sinners. If you sit here and say, I'm a good person, then you don't really need Jesus, do you? But... The problem is, you really need Jesus because you aren't a good person. <laughs> there is none righteous, no, not scales. I would just suggest that those, those scales were self-righteousness itself. And so here's Saul, and, and he sees in Jesus a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and Paul, chief of sinners, plunges beneath that flood and loses all his guilty stains. He receives his sight, and the Bible says he was baptized. Acts twenty two sixteen 16 gives us a little bit more here. It's a fuller statement of what happens. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash your way your sins, calling on his name. Now, listen, he does not say, arise and be baptized for the washing away of your sins. He says two things are to be done. Arise and be baptized, and have your sins wash away as you call on the name of the Lord. If baptism with water washed away sins, then there would be multitudes of people who have no sins, but baptism with water doesn't do that. Arise and be baptized as a sign that you're marked as the disciples, brother Saul. But you call upon the name of the Lord, and that's what washes your sins away. You call upon the Lord as the one to forgive you. Even as Isaiah put the coal to his lips and then was commissioned to go out and preach, the message of, of the coal would burn in him as he preached to a nation that would be under judgment, that would mark his ministry. So Paul is baptized. He's given a commission. He experiences forgiveness, and it's branded into him in those days that are marked by his entire ministry. I want to do one more thing before we close. I want to, I want to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 here. This text is remarkable. It really shows the importance of this conversion story. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says this wonderful, wonderful verse that it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the gospel, by the way. Among whom I am foremost of all. He never would have said that as a member of the Pharisees. Remember the conundrum? Piety, self-righteousness. He says, I'm a sinner. Not only am I a sinner, I'm, I'm foremost. Look at verse 16. Yet for this reason, I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. Paul is exhibit A in the courtroom in which the argument is Christ is alive. He's exhibit A. Paul is a prototype of all those who would believe in Christ. See, see church, this whole story, it's really, it's about amazing grace. And it really is amazing. Worst of sinners. 
hatred. You may sit here and say, I am, I'm not full of that kind of hatred that would murder anybody. What does Jesus say in Matthew 6? You got hatred in your heart? Guess what? You're a murderer. Road rage once, murderer. Bitterness once, murderer. Tongue used to slander anyone, murderer. But I'm pious, so is Saul. Saul is zealous for God. But Saul should have been destroyed. Jesus is the king. And yet, what does he do? He restrains and conquers all of his and our enemies. It's just amazing that Saul wasn't cast into hell. But he wasn't. It's mercy that God is gracious. It's mercy that Saul was brought to all the goads and had his sins forgiven and he called on the name of the Lord. It's grace that is great that takes the chief of sinners and makes them into followers. It takes the most antagonistic and it makes them the most wonderful trophies of grace. That's our God. He hunts down the hunter and he conquers the enemy. He puts another trophy in his great trophy case and says, this is one for whom I died. This is one to whom I sent my goats. This is one whose heart I changed. This is one whom I made from an enemy to a friend who will go into all the earth as I hope and pray we all will do and say, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Not the righteous, but sinners. And I am right here in the front. I'm chief. Friends, it's a glorious, amazing grace. And I hope you've experienced it. I hope you have. All right, well, now we take time to ask, answer any questions you might have about Acts 9, 9, 1 through 19. Anything you saw in there, anything you need clarification, anything at all. Brother Brock. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it's similar. I think Jesus, when he heals someone, there's scales that comes off the eyes too. And so I, I, don't, I don't think this is a, a, I mean, a, a common medical term of the day when people were blind, scales fell off. But, but it, it's interesting that Luke is historian and physician, and he writes this down as a happenstance. Absolutely. Yeah, Miss Becky? I think of all the symptoms, losing the sight mm. would have to be the most humbling. Um, you know, then you lose touch. Yeah. Sure. Or even here, at least you can still see where you're going. Right. You have no direction. Right. And, and you remember the blind in the Old Testament were, I mean, they were lowest of lows. Um, in fact, the, 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 the prophecy was always the Savior was going to be the one who came, who healed the blind. So it's a, it's a constant reminder that how God makes this, this self-righteous Pharisee blind. Uh, and, and you know what I love is that God commissioned Paul before there was ever any promise that he'd get his sight back. So, so Paul doesn't know when God tells him, when Christ tells him, you're going to be a, a missionary to the Gentiles. Paul doesn't know if he's going to be just the blind missionary to the Gentiles or not. So he's still commissioned even before his fine. But I think the, the, the symbolism there is it's fantastic. You're right. It's interesting. Yeah, Brother Frank? Yeah, he was kind of headed toward the Gentile area in Damascus. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I wonder what thoughts went through his head of, how do I explain this, right? How do I get to this? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Probably felt a lot like David when he went back in the Philistine army a lot, right? Because remember Saul's after him and David runs to the Philistines? I don't know, whatever. Get, might as well give it a shot. Anything else? Yeah, Brother Bob? Just interesting thought when Brother Corey was preaching the other night. Yeah. And he noted in, in Genesis 3, where God created light before He created the sun. Yeah. And that, could that have anything to do with the light? That... Absolutely. Is, is Jesus God? Yeah. yeah. He's the source of all light. He doesn't, God, Jesus doesn't need the sun to create light. In fact, I think as well of Exodus 33, where the glory of God passes before Moses, right? Moses gets a wicked sunburn, even though he doesn't ever see. He just sees the glimpse of the backside of the glory of God. And so this is, this is Christ speaking directly towards Paul in his eyes. I think it's mercy that Paul's eyes didn't burn out of his sockets at this light. He was just blinded, yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. His beard just incinerated. and We just missed that part. Luke didn't record that. Paul was embarrassed to mention that his beard incinerated. Yeah. Anything else? Miss Grace.
Yeah. Yeah. Thursday is this Saturday. Totally blind. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what I'm thankful for, Ms. Grace? Is that even if you're physically blind, you're not spiritually blind. That's right. That's the one that... That's right. Amen. I love that. So thankful for you, sister. Anything else? All right. Yes, Miss Phyllis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what is self-righteousness? You're dependent upon who when you're self-righteousness? Yourself. And so I think that's a perfect representation of that, is that the, the, the blindness comes and the humility comes, and then when the scales come off and the si- eyesight is back, it's in a, it's in a new creature one who is no longer spiritually blind and understands that he's dependent upon God for all things. Absolutely, that's a great word. Yeah. Brother Justin. I think it's also just burden our heart when we go around us. Sometimes we get so upset about how people around us can't believe people went out this way. We see it on the news, we see it all over the place. Um, and in Second Corinthians, Paul says in their case, the gospel was blinded the minds of unbelievers. Right. Right. Absolutely. We can't expect people that they're blind to act as though they can see. That's right. Absolutely. Our greatest hope for them is that is that God in his grace would would open their eyes. Yeah. And I think culturally for so long we've we've wanted people who just act right. And we didn't really care where the righteousness came from. We just want their behavior okay. And God's not after their behavior, friends. <laughs> He's after their hearts. Brother Justin's shining like the glory of Christ back there, that window coming in. <laughs> All right. Anything else before we close? You love the Word of God? I love this time together with you. I really do. Let's pray and thank Him for it. Father, we do thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You that if we're in Christ, that we are, we are not spiritually blind, but You have called us out of darkness into Your marvelous light. And it really is marvelous that we are able to behold Your glory Uh, Glory as the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth, that we see you for who you really are. And we know that's a work that you've caused in us and done in us. And so, Father, we beg you, uh, for those of us who know loved ones who are blind to the gospel, uh, Lord, that you would show them the light of your gospel and you would do as you did for Paul, Lord, knowing that no one's too far gone, no one... Lord, if you save Paul, the murderer of your church, then then certainly you can save our friends and family. So we ask you that we would live out the gospel to them, that we would share the gospel with them and love them with the gospel of Christ. And ultimately, Father, you would open their eyes to receive uh, the gospel of Christ and they would go from being blind uh, to seeing you and their eyes being opened. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you that they love the word of God and they Um, Lord, are engaged with the Word of God, and we pray that you continue to build us and mold us to the image of Christ. Be with us now as we go throughout our weeks. Father, may we seek you in all things and strive for Christ's likeness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.